I lie down. Very good. The meeting of the California Law Revision Commission will come to order. Could the executive director call the roll, please? Yes. So, um, Commissioner Huebner? Here. Commissioner B? Here. Commissioner Carrillo? Present. Commissioner Carrion indicated that she wasn't going to be able to make it. And I'm not hearing anything. Okay. Commissioner Jenkins? Here. Commissioner Kubas? Present. Commissioner Calra, or Assemblymember Calra, don't believe that he's joining. Commissioner King? I'm here. Senator Roth, I do not believe he is joining. And Commissioner Simpson? Here. Very good. We have a quorum. Well, the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Everybody received a draft. Are there any uh, requested changes? Hearing none, do we need a roll on this? I believe so. Please do. So, Commissioner B? Aye. Commissioner Carrillo? I'll abstain since I wasn't present. Commissioner Carrion is not present. Commissioner Kubas? Aye. Commissioner Heaver? Aye. Commissioner Jenkins? Aye. Assemblymember Palra is not here. Commissioner King? Uh, yes. Senator Roth is not here. And Commissioner Simpson? Aye. Very good. The next item are administrative matters. Uh, we will uh, turn the executive director to handle that bundle. Sure, I just have a very brief report. Um, mm -hmm. We have um, continued to work with Legislative Council to hopefully contract with them to help us meet our information technology needs, including emails um, and all the related matters that Kristen, I think, is far more expert at. Um, and should you have any questions? We're hoping that maybe we might be able to start the transition at the end of March, which would be nice timing because it would be in between meetings. So if there's any difficulties, um, we could hopefully work them out before then. We're not anticipating it, um, that there will be, but it, one never knows. Uh, and I'll talk about the next issue probably a little more. Um, we are going to be talking about the schedule. We have been um, <clears throat> trying to figure out the logistics of doing these hybrid meetings, including travel, where to have them, you know, what the costs are, and related issues. It, it's um, it's quite a task, and we really want to thank our thank our administrative staff for working through it. Uh, but we can talk a little bit. Of, bit more about it, or if you have any questions right now, um, please let me know. Any questions? Is this um, questions about what? We oh, format? Any questions under the report of the executive director? Do you have any questions for me about that? That pretty much right. Here and done. Okay. Okay. And then next. Yes. Is commissioner suggestions. Do we have any commissioner suggestions today? Commissioner Correa? I, I renew my suggestion that we consider the Little Hoover Commission's position that that body and ours are both advisory only, thus permitting us to have fully remote meetings. I know staff so, has looked at this. I suggest we take another look at it. Yeah. Commissioner, I've, I've already asked the executive director to, um, on in multiple avenues of inquiry, investigate whether there is a way to return to remote meetings. The hybrids are very cumbersome. Uh, the logistics are difficult. 
And um, so there is going to be a full investigation because there are two or three different options available to us to determine whether we can whether we have or can get approval to remain remote. Super. So We're on the same page. That's been put on the docket of the executive director, and I expect uh, at our next meeting we'll have a report back on findings. Thank you. Any other suggestions? <clears throat> okay. Thank you. I think the next item on the agenda is the open government laws, which Steve will be presenting. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I guess testing to make sure everyone can hear me. I'll assume yes. so. Somebody signals otherwise. So this is memorandum 2024-2. It's the uh, annual uh, memo to the commission summarizing open government law and reporting on any new developments over the course of the past year. As the memo indicates, uh, the staff has no new developments to report. So most of the memo is the same as it's been in previous years, at least last year, except for what was just discussed, the teleconferencing procedures. There is a new uh, statute for this year and next year, which provides an alternative method by which state bodies can conduct teleconference meetings. And that's discussed in the memo. The discussion of teleconferencing begins on page five and continues for a few pages. It sets out the differences between the procedure we're using now and what could be this other alternative procedure, which is one of the alternative procedures that Commissioner Huber was referencing. Um, there's no decisions required based on this memo, so I'll just see if anyone has asked if anyone has any questions. Are there any questions or comments on this memo by commissioners? Hearing none. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Now, Kristen, uh, I can't see from here if we have any members of the public on or if anyone has a hand raised. Do we have members of the public? And if so, is anyone interested in talking on this memo? We have uh, 14 participants. Unfortunately, my computer needs to be plugged in right now, and so I can't have it right in front of me, but I am kind of taking a glance back periodically. If any members of the public who are on computer want to speak, they can raise their hand via Zoom. If members of the public want to speak who are on the phone, in order to raise your hand, you press star nine. Um, and I will just double check and make sure I, but I didn't see any hand raised when I just checked. No hands right now. Very good. Thank you. A meeting schedule is the next item. Okay. So this will have some crossover with the antitrust memo that's also on the agenda today. But, um, and then noting that we just discussed further exploration of the need to have hybrid meetings versus the ability to meet via Zoom, like the Commission has been doing for the past couple of years. So we set out um, recommendations for when that would be a hybrid or potentially Zoom meeting in, in the memo. And then we also set out three in-person meetings April 18th in Sacramento, June 20th in Silicon Valley, and August 15th in Los Angeles. The, they're kind of nicely spaced in that they're not one month after another, so it'll give folks a, a little chance to recover from the travel. The reason, and I'll get into it in further detail when we talk about the antitrust issues, um, is that there's such a high level of interest in the commission's work on antitrust and, and the other issues, but by far, I think we're getting the most uh, public attention right now from the antitrust um, stakeholders. So that is the reason for the suggestion that we have some in-person meetings. We just have the time scheduled as 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. because that's the, the usual schedule, but I think we can look at ways to perhaps get more bang for our buck and have longer meetings 
on those days that folks are traveling, um, you know, it makes sense to tackle as many issues as we possibly can. Um, I think the other thing we might look into, if, you know, if the commission agrees that we should have the, these in-person meetings is whether the 9.30 a.m. start time is best for travel considerations. So that'll be, uh, take some looking at what the Southwest flight schedule is and other um, scheduling issues. I think as, as everybody knows, traffic, with the exception of Sacramento, which can, can at times get a little dicey, traveling in the Silicon Valley, San Jose area, and Los, Ale Los Angeles can be quite challenging. So we we'll wanna make sure we set something that, that's realistic and, and works for folks. So what we're asking, um, today is whether the commission should decide to adopt the proposed schedule and I have it as hybrid and in-person meetings with or well, without changes. I suppose the, the change would be looking into whether we can do Zoom meetings versus these um, hybrid meetings spread throughout the state. So okay, well, let's, let's break this down. Um, if commissioners would focus on the three proposed in-person meetings, which as the executive director indicated, uh, have been flagged as in-person uh, to stimulate and hear comment on the antitrust project, are there commission comments or objections to those three meetings as scheduled? Commissioner Carrillo. For the one on August 15th, um, that's the first week of school for me. And my class is almost certainly going to be on Wednesday or Thursday. So I'm pretty sure I could not do in person in LA. I can beam in if that's permissible, but I, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to be in person in LA on that date. I don't know if that matters. It, it certainly matters. We'd like your input. Um, the ex executive director, my understanding is if Commissioner Carrillo um, puts a sign on his door indicating there is a commission in progress and members of the public are allowed to attend in the same room with him, then we're in compliance. Is that correct? Steve, you just looked at this issue. Is that correct? Well, I guess it depends to some extent about what the rest of the setup is. That the at least according to the statute, the public also has to be able to observe the meeting. And if they come in and communicate to the rest of the body from that location as well. Yeah, I probably would use the um, the dean's conference room, which Sarah and Commissioner B are currently sitting in, or, or the equivalent. So it sounds like it's not a problem. Yeah. Sorry, it's the, that, sounds, that sounds like compliance. I mean... Uh, Okay, and essentially uh, you are doing now, right? Yep. Right. Very good. Then we've got the well, LPU with we the proper notice. It's kind of just clean the site. Right. That's to be the Brown Act notice saying that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to post it on our website uh, 10 days prior to the meeting. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, once the commissioner has the site identified, as we did the last, do what we did the last time, which is put it on the website agenda notice. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like we are then fine with the three in person. Are there any comments about the proposed hybrids? I may not, I guess be, I, able to, I, I may not be able to attend the March 21 meeting, but if you have a quorum, go ahead and proceed without me. Um, for the commissioner's uh, awareness, one thing I've asked um, the executive director to look at is projected utilization of all of these other meetings um, so that if we're looking at a 90 minute meeting it may not be worth having the 90 minute meeting unless there are action items that require a vote so if we approve this schedule it's subject to potentially withdrawing a meeting if the schedule does not merit uh, consuming commissioners time. Are there any other uh, comments or questions about the schedule? 
I have, a, I have a comment. Oh, please. Go ahead. Commissioner Jenkins. Um, so does that mean for August 15th, since Commissioner Carrillo cannot appear in person, that that would necessarily be a hybrid meeting? I think that it would still be an in-person meeting that would encourage as many commissioners to attend as possible. This we're receiving public input, and part of the discussion when uh, the legislature was going back, you know, returning to the pre-COVID days in um, Bagley Keene was the need for the uh, public to have access to commissioners in person. So I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Got it. Okay. Okay, Mr. B. Mr. B. I'm sorry. Did are we voting on the Yeah, on the on the proposal. Sorry, I. Okay, Mr. Carrillo. Aye. Mr. Carrion is not present. Mr. Kubas. Aye. Commissioner Heavner. Aye. Commissioner Jenkins. Aye. Assembly Member Palra is not present. Assembly Member or Commissioner King. Aye. Senator Roth is not present. Commissioner Simpson. Aye. Okay, motion carried. Stay with you. Very good. Thank you. The next agenda item is the 2024 legislative program. Okay, so this is an informational um, item. We are very pleased and thankful to Assembly Member Paula for agreeing to carry the Commission's resolution of authority this year. We set out, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but in the memo, we set out what is in that resolution. This resolution, given everything that the Commission already has on its plate is uh, would reauthorize what we have now for the next legislative session. And then the other issue, and I might ask Kristen to help a little bit with this, but um, we have some ongoing um, issues related to trial court restructuring, which are basically technical mm -hmm. in nature. Um, the commission had recommended a, an amendment to Penal Code Section 2620 that was omitted from, from the original legislation. Staff has requested amendments to be considered for inclusion in a committee bill, an omnibus committee bill this session, so it should be pretty straightforward, no problems. In addition, the commission will be considering approval of a final T, uh, trial court restructuring recommendation proposing repeal of penal code section 1463.5. The staff has also made inquiries about possible inclusion of this repeal in the committee in, in the committee bill we were discussing, pending final commission approval. And then the last one is that uh, staff has continued to monitor the status of chaptered out conforming revisions for the commission's recently implemented recodification of the California Public Records Act and the Carpenter Presley Tanner Hazardous Substances Account Act. Uh, the staff has requested that those confirming revi conforming revisions be considered for inclusion in the annual maintenance of the code bill. So Kristen, I just wanted to see if you had anything to add to that. No, I, I guess I'll just note, you know, the recodifications happened uh, several years back, we have been continuing to monitor because a lot of the sort of cross-reference updates that we were working on have gotten chaptered out for various reasons. They're typically part of much longer sections that were being substantively revised that year. Um, so we sort of intended to continue monitoring them uh, for some time. I'm not sure that we will continue to do that indefinitely because it is uh, somewhat of a burden. But we've gotten most all of those conforming revisions taken care of over the course of the last few years. 
and we will you know keep an eye on them this year and, and next year but um beyond that you know some of these things they are regularly amended and we are continuing to get chaptered out so we'll hope that they get incorporated somehow and i just want to note that if they do not we do have protective language in our recodifications making clear that any cross references to the old law should be construed as cross references to the new law so that's that oh, thank you any questions hearing no questions the next item on the agenda is the big one the antitrust law study sure sure so um as the commission knows the staff recruited experts to assist the commission in the antitrust study the seven they informed us to seven groups which are outlined in the memo and um, the scope of the work for reference is described in memorandum 2023-16 by the end of january the staff is Please to report that we received draft reports from each working group, which the staff and our expert consultant, Cheryl Johnson, are reviewing. And the staff is extremely grateful for the invaluable assistance that these experts have provided. As I think the commission has noted previously, the report that they prepared for the commission will establish a protocol foundation for the commission's deliberations. So now that we have the draft report and we are um, in, in contact with the, the various groups, um, if if there is a need to do some fine tuning, um, we are presenting a schedule that would provide the commission an opportunity to hopefully hear from one or more of the experts on each of the groups at the meeting. We also anticipate that there um, could be considerable public comment and we're considering whether it would also be helpful to have additional in, invited speakers to flesh out the issues. Um, our expert consultant, Cheryl Johnson, will also be available at the meetings for questions or comments. So the, the idea is to look at this as sort of phase two, phase one was the education uh, phase of the antitrust study, which has happened the past year. Yeah, phase two is hearing from our expert reports, our expert analysis, um, what they're flagging, you know, what potential issues the commission might consider and um, as the reports are rolled out, the commission would also have an opportunity to say, staff, please find out additional information on, that, on X, Y, or Z, and you could continue to work with the experts or um, reach out to others or do independent research as necessary. Uh, to encourage robust public comment, the staff intends to publish the memoranda with the applicable final expert report attached at least three weeks prior to the scheduled meeting. So we're hoping that will give um, folks opportunity to respond and also recognizing that the commission continues to receive public comment throughout the study period. So that doesn't mean it would be the only time to have a bite at the apple. So um, based on the, the uh, previous memo where we discussed the schedule, we have a, a list of when we think it'll work for the various um, expert reports to be presented. In a supplemental memo, we do, did um, receive a request from the Concentration in California work group to switch with a single firm conduct work group. So then single firm conduct would be on March 21st and um, concentration in California would be on April 18th, I believe. But these, we're still, we've heard back from a few of the groups. We're still kind of 
finalizing them. But the idea, as you can see, is to to roll the reports out incrementally so that there's ample time for public comment, ample time for the commissioners to ask, ask questions. And of course, we'll have our other ongoing work on the agenda as well. And we did receive further public comment related to um, the European Union's Digital Markets Act, which is attached to the memorandum. This, um, this seems to be a level of high interest to especially the um, technology sector. So we anticipate we will be hearing much more on this issue. And this report is from Professor Jonathan Barnett in his capacity uh, uh, as a like uh, as a um, I'm sorry an independent research organization is yes, that he's the director of it was commissioned by the Chamber of Progress which is an industry trade association devoted to a progressive society economy workplace first and consumer climate. It's primarily composed of um, folks in the technology industry, and um, they have reached out to us more than once, and I think we'll be seeking ongoing participation on the various issues as the reports move forward. So that's what I have on antitrust. I have a question. Sure. What steps are we taking to stimulate public comment? So we, <clears throat> as you know, we have the listserv, and a, a number of people are on the listserv. We have had um, contact by a number of groups, including the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Progress. Um, there's a group that's basically a coalition of labor organizations. To, to name a few. So it seems like the world word is out there. Um, we also want to make sure that we're in communication with the antitrust section of the California Bar Association. So um, it, it's, it seems like there's growing interest. I think there wasn't as much public comment previously because it was the education phase. But at this point, we're receiving, now that we're, folks know that the reports are coming in and that the commission is going to be hearing them, there seems to be more interest. We also are going to be reaching out to various um, legislative offices and the governor's office to make sure that they know what we're working on. And if the commission has any further suggestions for public outreach, we'd love to hear it. My only a suggestion is maybe we have received written comments, but perhaps uh, soliciting some preliminary written comments, because I hate to be in a position where key organizations will say, oh, you know, we asked to give feedback and now the report is here and we could have get, given earlier feedback. So I'm just wondering, sometimes you have great ideas from folks in the very beginning versus after you publish a report. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, have they written any written materials to us as feedback or ideas? We, so I'm sorry, could you repeat the first part of the question? So uh, my thinking is, do we wait until there's a written report or something in writing to elicit written comments? versus earlier and eliciting written comments or uh, letters so, or the record prior? So for all of the groups that we've talked to so far, uh -huh. we have encouraged them to submit written comment prior. Right. So, the, so when we were talking about the study in terms of phases, we, the first year is education, second year sort of report, mm -hmm. um, roll out and further inquiry. And then it, from there, it would move into more of the traditional, okay, let's start looking at what are the issues that commission wants to make recommendations on, what kind of language that 
should we be seeing? So what we're hoping and um, will continue to reach out on is to receive as much public input as we can during the second phase, because that could really help inform the commission's decisions in the third phase. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. It's always good to get feedback way in advance versus later and then a little bit trickier. Absolutely <laughs> agree. And you know, some entities even do round tables, right? It may not be with any of us as commissioners, but you as executive director, you know, could have a round table with interested stakeholders where it's just a verbal conversation. I don't know, just some ideas because it seems like this is a very hot topic and we will get a lot of feedback, hopefully. And it's always nice to do the reach out in the very beginning of the industry experts. Absolutely. So, commissioners, uh, I met with the executive director and the consultant to discuss the organization of the project, because this is so big and complex that it could easily spin out of control. So um, in line with Mr. Kubas's comments, are there any other comments about the process or about the schedule? We'd like to lock the process, not lock it, but we'd like to flush out any commissioner suggestions or comments about the process so that the process can be locked and we can move forward in uh, an orderly fashion. So any further comments about process or stakeholder engagement or ordering of the individual subtopics? Hearing none, Sharon, do you have what you need from us on antitrust today? I, I do, just a couple of follow-ups. Um, we did submit the supplement, oh, supplemental. Good memo um, and that sets out the the change to the rollout anticipated rollout um interestingly enough the single firm conduct group has to be moved because there's a large um antitrust meeting i think at the university of chicago that day so and then the other public comment is we, we've had i already touched on this but just to reiterate it reassure the public that we have received some, some questions about the ability to submit written public comment for consideration on a specific topic um, if a, a commenter isn't able to submit it in time for the when the commission is going to hear the expert reports and as i already mentioned the commission receives public comment throughout the study. So, and if there are particular issues where we needed to put something back on the agenda for further consideration, there, there's way, ways we can get to it and make sure that the commission is hearing public comment throughout the period. And again, to reiterate, we're hoping to receive as much robust public comment as possible during um, this, uh, second phase of the study. And I, I'm wondering, um, Kristen, whether there is any public comment now that we're talking about public comment. So I don't see any hands raised now, but if any of the attendees want to speak, um, you can use the hand raise function on Zoom, or if you are on phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. No. Give just a second, but I do not see any hands. I will uh, keep an eye on that for the next few minutes and let you know. Okay. Thank you. The next agenda item is our Equal Rights Amendment project. So over to you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Let me put that computer down and get turned around. Uh, good morning, commissioners. So on the agenda today for the ERA study is Memorandum 2024-6. Um, so first, just after the introductory material, there are two brief case updates. Um, before describing those cases, I do want to note that these updates are not intended to sort of exhaustively cover all of the developments in this area. We really are just trying to kind of highlight some, some key things that are happening that have either been brought to our attention or that staff has, has come across. Um, 
The first case is one that's pending at the Supreme Court, and it relates to the standard for showing that there has been sex discrimination. Um, effectively, the question boils down to when you are trying to, when you prove that an employment decision, in this case, it was a transfer, um, is based on sex, is that alone sufficient to demonstrate uh, discrimination or whether you must also show that the employment decision causes a materially significant disadvantage? Um, we noted this case in part because the commission had looked closely at the federal employment discrimination uh, case law and statute um, earlier on in this study. So we will continue to monitor this and we'll report back to the commission when that uh, decision is issued. That was argued, I believe, back in December. The second case is a decision from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court evaluating the constitutionality of a statutory ban on the use of Medicaid funds for abortion under their state constitutional ERA. Um, I do want to note there was a one missing word and an important missing word in the memo. Um, it should have noted that the court concluded that the ban is likely unconstitutional. The court did uh, remand to the lower courts to make a final assessment, but the standard, um, as the court indicates in the language, is quite high, and the court made clear that this uh, ban is subject to scrutiny under the state constitutional ERA. So those are the case updates provided in this memo. Starting on page four, the memo discusses how the commission might craft a statutory backstop uh, provision. So the, in this first phase of the work, we've been working on sort of a broad statutory sex equality rule. And for now, we the staff has sort of been envisioning this as focusing on sex discrimination specifically. Um, that seems to be kind of the, the key place where um, we can look at the law's treatment of sex. And we've looked carefully, like I said, at the federal uh, employment discrimination law and California's broad anti-discrimination laws. The, what we found in that look at California's laws is that those broad anti-discrimination laws in the areas of like housing, employment, education, generally contain ex broad express coverage. They expressly identify a number of characteristics that the commission had previously looked at and concluded were under the umbrella of sex and in the federal employment discrimination context are indeed just treated as under that in umbrella. However, um, in looking at it, the staff has found that the California statutes include a number of sort of more narrow and specific anti-discrimination provisions. And often those do not contain as much detail. In the staff's view, it's likely that this has happened just because the law's development over time has focused more heavily on those broader laws that have the bigger impact. And in fact, that these laws are not intended to have a different scope in terms of what sorts of uh, characteristics they're being protected. And given that, um, the staff is sort of viewing the character of the reform we describe on page six as providing a rule to expressly state the broad scope of California's sex discrimination prohibitions and protections against discrimination to make clear that anytime there is a rule that says you may not discriminate on the basis of sex, that includes the different characteristics that the commission looked at and concluded were within that umbrella. Um, that is, I guess, the sort of concept that we see for this, this initial reform. I wanted to just kind of get the feeling of the commissioners. I don't know if the commissioners have any comments or thoughts, if that seems in line with what the commission was anticipating. Hearing none, I think that's that. Wait, is the wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Carrillo, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, just a clarifying question so I, I, I make sure I understand your intention here. You're thinking about uh, an umbrella interpretive rule section that would go somewhere in the civil code or something like that that says anytime there is a statute elsewhere <laughs> in this code that pertains to sex discrimination, the term sex in that phrase is to be interpreted as follows. Is that? that the idea? Yeah, roughly along those lines. So the idea would be that we would sort of be defining the term sex discrimination as including discrimination on the following bases. And yeah. you're actually sort of stepping into our the next question that the memo presents, which is where should we put such a rule? Um, <laughs> okay. And so that that is uh, we'll get to that shortly. But yes, 
I, okay. I agree. I just want to make sure I, I was clear on that. I, I, I agree with you. Um, defining into the context of as it's used in, in the particular phrase sex discrimination, it, it eliminates a problem that you'd earlier identified of the word sex shows up in a lot of statutes in a variety of contexts. And, you know, so umbrella defining that is actually riskier here. So anyway. absolutely. And yes, so um, I should mention that the memo notes briefly that we looked at the idea of just defining sex, but there are a number of contexts as Commissioner Carrillo notes where that is not going to be appropriate. And therefore we concluded that that would not be the best course of action. So we wanted to focus on the term discrimination in combination with sex. Okay. Kristen, I'm not hearing any objection to taking that approach going forward. What's your next question? And so the next question, which Commissioner Korea sort of stepped, stepped us Just into was, where, where does it go? Where will we put such a rule? Um, one of the things that the staff has in mind is ideally this would ensure consistency, not just within a single code, but across the codes. Now that's certainly a lot more complicated. In that case, one provision that does this for the entire like set of California codes would be the best. That would ensure that there was a single place that you could look that had the rule that applies everywhere. You would not see as much like the discrepancies would not arise as easily, right? If you were looking to change the scope of sex discrimination, this would be the provision you would, would likely change. It would help to ensure uniformity. Um, in staff's initial look, we didn't find many provisions that had such a scope. Uh, there are some old provisions from like the 1872 codes <laughs> that um, apply outside the code that they're located in, but for the most part, the rules and the statutes apply in the code that they're in. Um, given that, the staff is somewhat reluctant to do the single rule for all codes approach. Uh, there is also kind of the practical concern that finding such a rule is a lot harder um, for using the codes. If you're looking at a rule in, say, the Business and Professions Code, where there are a number of uh, anti-discrimination rules, you would not necessarily think to go look to the civil code to find an interpretive rule that would shine light on what you're looking at. For that reason, um, the staff is sort of tentatively leaning towards a rule in each code. And that rule would be identical. It would be located towards the beginning and either like the general provisions or the preliminary provisions of each code. And the downside I think of that is, you know, there are the possibilities where certain discrimination protections that are maybe a bigger focus that have a broader impact would be the ones that might be refined earlier on, and so there could be the possibility of discrepancies arising between those rules over time. Um, the staff notes, you know, we're happy to look into the possibility of a single rule for all codes in more detail, if the commission would like, but otherwise, at this point, I think the staff's tentative direction would be to do a single rule in each code. So I seek a hand from Commissioner Simpson. Yeah, just a question. Um... Uh, suppose we had a, a broad um, definition in the education code. That's where I lived for a long time. Um, that said this applies throughout the code. And then um, two years later, there's a new um, anti-discrimination statute related to something in education world. And in that new statute, it um, defines sex, discrimination on the basis of sex, a little differently than the broad one. That would then supersede the broad one, would it not? It would be a later enacted statute that had a different meaning. You can't, right? Yeah, so it, I think there are some, some language that we could possibly include, making clear that notwithstanding any other provision of the codes, there might be ways that we could try to protect against that. Um, I do want to note something that's also discussed a little bit later in this memo is the idea that this would be a floor and not a ceiling. So to the extent that people wanted to make clear that there were other forms of sex discrimination right. that we should include, that's not something that we would intend to foreclose. This would be kind of the, the, the bottom. So you would look here and see if it's included here, but you could also supplement that out. Right. I, was, I was thinking of actually something that might be the opposite of that, it, that, that if you had a, a somewhat narrower definition for purposes of whatever you're doing, a later enacted statute presumably would supersede the earlier enacted statute that had a broader definition. 
I think that's that's definitely possible. Um, and I don't know that that's something that we could prevent altogether. Yeah. We could try to take steps to ensure that it didn't happen unintentionally, but you know, the legislature could come back and decide that for whatever reason in this context, the rule should be somewhat different. Would that suggest that we ought to think about the constitution? Yeah, I thought that, about that too. So that is an option. I will just note, um, so that was something that the staff uh, brought up earlier on in this study as a possibility. Um, in general, it's an odd position for the commission to be in. The commission does not typically get involved in constitutional work and most of the constitutional, and I, the, the only constitutional work that I can think of really was um, kind of an implementation issue around trial court restructuring. So it was not something that drew a lot of attention. It wasn't sort of maybe breaking policy ground, those sorts of things. Um, in an area where the intended effect would be more broad, broad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's an unusual place for the commission to be, and the commission is not necessarily well suited to sort of carry that forward into, you know, the the process that you would take to mm -hmm. amend the constitution. So that that's something the commission could consider. I mean, we we can um, so, uh, propose a revision of the constitution. Um, I don't know that there's any reason that we couldn't. But it is just worth keeping in mind yeah. that it is a potentially, you know, a big and expensive campaign that would go along with that in yeah. the end, um, and not something that the commission itself is well suited to be involved with or run. It, so, it also makes it a whole thing. Uh, no, I don't know if you can see my hand raised, but but uh, I'd be very disinclined to tamper with the constitution for something like this. But it seems yeah. to me that we can do a little bit more than what you're saying about putting it in each individual section. We can put commentary in addition to putting it in each individual section, stating that you know our 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 scope is broader and that we're putting it in each individual section for for you know uh, certain purposes. But we're not saying that it's only limited specifically to this specific section. Uh, you know, some sort of commentary along those lines, trying to have our cake and eat it too. Yeah, so I, I should note, I mean, this memo really focuses on the proposed statutory revision itself, but of course the commission has comments for all of the revisions it proposes. Um, those comments are often somewhat limited, but the, it may be appropriate in this context to consider uh, more in-depth commentary. I see Commissioner Carrillo's hand. Yeah, you know, I, I guess we have three options here. Um, constitution single provision in the beginning of the civil code, like probably in section 13 or 14. I'm sure you looked at that or or what Victor just said. And I I, I would suggest we pursue Victor's suggestion of including it in the commentary. And and it like one useful thing we could do is to be to cross-reference all half a dozen places that this provision simultaneously appears in in all of the comments. You know, so for the one in the education code, the comment could say that a similar or a parallel position also appears in the following six codes. And then each of the other six codes refers to the other five. So it's as much, it makes it as obvious as possible that this is a broad, you know, cross code definition. Yeah, I mean, that may be a way to try to accomplish a single provision without actually doing it as a single yeah. provision that we're saying that these all should be understood together. Yeah, um, well, I do want to know. I was going to say the last thing I was going to say that'll that'll flag it for the legislature. You know, the, if the concern is that they might inadvertently change one code section and create an anomalously different definition that doesn't sync up with the others, like that comment will be a flag to them to say, if you're going to do it here, you need to do it elsewhere, please. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> to avoid the inconsistency. So did you indicate there was somebody from the public wishing to comment? Yes, I did just glance back and notice that there was a hand raised. Does the commission want to take a comment at this time? Yes, go ahead. If it's pertinent to the point we're discussing, let's do it. Yes, so I see uh, is Kathy Spiller. Uh, no, yes, I will allow her to talk. So just give a moment for her to get connected here. Kathy, you should be connected, it looks like. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Just a, a brief comment, and I wish I was a constitutional law scholar <laughs> because it would, it, I'd feel more confident about all of this, but two things. Um, 
we're always more confident when we have a provision in the Constitution that expressly prohibits sex discrimination and that is available for use in any situation in which state law policy, uh, local government um, uh, regulations, uh, laws, policy uh, would be covered. It, it, we never know what the future holds. Um, statutes are always subject to change depending on the political winds and the direction they're blowing. Um, and hence, it's the reason we're pushing so hard for the federal Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, secondly, just a practical question, and I'm not sure where it would be covered under government code, but for example, in prisons, um, it's our understanding that in many women's prisons, uh, menstrual products are not provided. Uh, that's clearly sex discriminatory. I don't know where something like that would fall. Um, there may be other situations like that. And so again, um, always prefer the constitutional protections uh, or would, you know, as a fallback, as broad as we can be um, so that it always becomes an issue no matter what section of the statutes we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Correa? Yeah, um, she, she mentioned constitutional law scholar, um, which sort of calls for me, I think. Um, so if I could just briefly uh, respond to uh, um, the, the member of the public. Uh, we, we looked at this issue. Uh, the staff took a deep dive on it early in this study. Um, and I could tell you that for fairly good substantive reasons, um, there's concerns about creating uh, unanticipated problems if we go to the Constitution. I mean, leaving aside the whole you know political campaign, it could lose. Um, you know, le leaving the practical considerations aside, um, the feeling I think, you know, if I can summarize it, the feeling is that um, California's existing equal protection constitutional uh, protections are already quite good. Um, and, and there's concern about the risk of diluting those. Um, and, and so the, the focus is on the statutes for prudential concerns. It, we, by, by, going, by going big with a constitutional provision, we, we're very concerned about unanticipated problems. It's Kristen, a don't fix it and faint broke. Kristen, it, your intention today is to get a sense of the commission rather than a formal decision. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I did just want to see uh, whether the commission, it seemed like there, would the commission, I guess, like the staff to look more detail into whether or not we could have a single statutory provision. Is that something that we should uh, re research a bit further? Um, like I, I mentioned, we didn't find a lot of examples. Um, another possibility is to reach out to the Office of Legislative Council and talk to them about whether or not such an approach would be viable. And if so, if there are any suggestions on how to craft such an approach. But the other option, which we've been discussing is just have similar provisions in the different codes have commentary or even statutory language that might connect those provisions and make clear that they are related. Um, is there a direction between those two that the commission would want staff to lean at this point? Kristen, it's all the commissioners who spoke seem to favor the fulsome cross-referencing. Okay. Is there any commissioner who would like to speak in favor of looking for a place to plop a single provision? Hearing none, I think that's the direction, Kristen, and if as the project proceeds, um, another option presents, present the option to us and we'll discuss it. Oh, can I ask one more question? Uh, kind of related. Uh, the the uh, question from the commentary of public comment, triggered something that's been bothering me about this whole discussion, or, or not bothering, but, but making me wonder, uh, to what extent do we need to hold back on the application of our concepts to the penal code? Because after all, we have a sister commission, a penal reform commission, and all these things we've been talking about in the meetings are related to the civil code. But obviously, as the public commentator made about the uh, situation in jails, there's there's implications for the penal code. 
So I'm just wondering, and I'm saying just wondering, I'm not criticizing, I'm just wondering, does our jurisdictional reach, especially since we have a companion penal commission that's part of the Chapter Law Revision Commission, should we actually be even in these broad statements of what sex discrimination are, in some way have language stating that this is more for the civil code and less so for the penal code, or is the full intention for this to have applicability on both the civil and penal code? So I do want to note, uh, you know, as Commissioner King notes, it's we've been focusing more on civil law as opposed to uh, criminal law, penal code issues. Moving on to the next phase, we will be looking at like specific issues within the statutes. Um, I did not have in mind that we would have the penal code completely off the table. I do have in mind, though, that if we are going to be proposing something with respect to the penal code, we will be reaching out to talking to the staff and potentially even the committee themselves, uh, depending on what the issue is. So we want to make sure it's certainly that they are aware of, of what we're doing. Um, it is not my understanding that the commission cannot make any changes to the penal code because that's completely within their jurisdiction, but it is something where we think it is very important to coordinate, make sure they've had a chance to take a look at it, see if there are any concerns that they have. Um, and we also will, you know, need to check in and see whether they might be working on any sex equality issues in that area and might have any suggestions. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Kristen, when you think it's the appropriate time, do make that outreach so that they're aware we're aware of what they're doing and they're aware of what we're doing. Yeah, so I do anticipate the possibility that we would put this uh, discrimination rule in the penal code as well. That would potentially be one of the locations, and that would be a time to check in with them and make sure that they are aware of this. They've had an opportunity to review it, and if you know they have any questions or concerns, we would certainly welcome hearing that. Very good. Okay, um, so the next item in the memo, there were a couple of minor drafting issues that we addressed towards the end. Um, on page eight, the staff just wanted to note for the commission an issue that has come up repeatedly is the idea that this uh, rule would be expressly non-exclusive. We want to make clear that we are not intending to foreclose and be to exhaustively identify what sex discrimination uh, is, but instead, like I said, create a floor, not a ceiling. We want to make room for there to be, you know, for that umbrella to expand as needed. Um, that it has seemed to be consistent with the commission's prior decision, so I don't think that there's any need for uh, input on that point. I just wanted to make that clear. The other issue, which is kind of a question, and I think the staff would be leaning towards including a statement that this rule is actually declarative of existing law. What we are finding is that you know many of these things that are within the umbrella are now understood to be part of sex discrimination. We don't want the enactment of a rule that expressly states that that to be construed as saying that that was not true previously. We are trying to clarify and make express what we already understand to be true in terms of the scope of sex discrimination. So the staff uh, would recommend, I think, that we include language that the rule is declarative of existing law to avoid any implication that we are making a change that previously uh, it should have been understood more narrowly. Just oh. any Commissioner Simpson. Just a question on that. Um, if we have a broad um, definition, including but not limited to definition that um, uh, code, and we say this is declaratory of existing law, and there is a section of that same code that has a narrower definition, which trumps which if it's if if it's saying we're this is declaratory of existing law and some piece of existing law has a narrower definition wouldn't that uh other statute still govern what in whatever condition that is yeah yeah being conflict so we can take a look at whether or not there's any definitions that we would be in direct conflict with um my general sense is that the main areas where sex is defined are in those broad um, anti-discrimination things that we've already looked at, the laws on housing, employment, education, and those do contain definitions. I'm not sure that in any case those definitions are clearly exclusive, 
So I think there may be room to sort of reconcile on that basis. I will note that in some instances, the terms that are are defined separately. So yeah. sexual orientation, I think, is one example where that is actually defined separately and sort of included on its own as a characteristic on which you are prohibited from discriminating. Um, so there is maybe an interpretive question as to whether or not we're saying, oh, that's included within sex, whereas in this other context, they've clearly listed it separately and individually. Um, it's something I think that the staff will have to look more okay. into and think more about. I don't have a an immediate answer to that, but my general sense is that California being proactive about including characteristics in its anti-discrimination laws, I don't know that we've, at least from my, from my view, we, I haven't thought about that as saying we don't think that they're within the scope of sex. It's that we want to make clear that they are covered by this anti-discrimination protection. And so it may have been implemented right. in different ways. And so that may kind of raise a question. So that's something we can look at. Yeah, I was thinking more, you know, something that was enacted, you know, 20 years ago might in and of itself have a narrower definition than we're, than we're proposing. And to, to say in a new proposal to say what we're doing here is declaratory of existing law. I wouldn't want that have to have the effect of of saying, yeah, the narrow definition is fine. I mean, that, that's my concern. Okay. Kristen, my one concern with the memo is the one that Commissioner Simpson raised. Because if we say it's declarative, okay. this is declarative of existing law, we're incorporating whatever that existing law is. Well, it's perhaps yeah. our case is, is, is interpreting that existing law. So I think this requires some more thought. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, so I appreciate that. Berkeley, can you please mute your room? Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, we're getting a very strange echo there. Um, that is something we can look at in more detail. Um, I do think the statement is worth making if we can make it, but as the commissioners pointed out, there might be some legal issues with making that statement. So that I will mark for future research. Kristen, uh, um, there, Kristen there are uh, drafting techniques for do, doing what you want to do, but adding some additional language to establish that it's declarative of not just existing law, but existing law and then a qualifier qualifier to establish what we're actually saying. So there are different sure. ways to do with this. I would say just keep it on the top of your list of as we go along, but we don't need to make a decision today. Absolutely. And yeah, I think that this was more conceptual as opposed to saying the specific language. So Commissioner Hebner, as you know, you know, it may be that we can sort of broaden what we're saying there, that we understand that the, you know, the discrimination protections extend to all of these characteristics without saying specifically that they are understood as part of sex discrimination, which may be sort of at odds with how California law has developed. We do extend the protections on all those classes, but we do not necessarily have an always slotted them in um, under sex discrimination. So that gives staff very good direction. So I appreciate that discussion. I did want to just ask if the commission has any other direction or suggestions uh, from for staff regarding this reform. Hearing none. Thank you, Kristen. Excellent work on a difficult project. Thank you, commissioners. Now, commissioners, we've been sitting for an hour. Does anybody, uh, would anyone propose we take a 10 or 15 minute break or? I second that. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes break. 10 minutes or 15? 10. 10's fine. Okay. Let, we will return then at yeah, 10 minutes from now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 10 for record. So 1047. And otherwise, I think we are ready to go. Very good. Thank you. We've got um, our next agenda item is state and local agency access. Who will be presenting on this? 
Access to consumer information. Um, and, and it formed the basis for Commissioner and Assemblymember Colorado's AB 522, which is currently installed in the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, we met with Assemblymember Colorado's staff since the last commission meeting, um, and we're awaiting feedback on some of the concerns. Um, I'm hoping to have something more solid by the next commission meeting. Um, are there any questions on this item? Hearing none. Thank you, Sarah. Let's move on to the next. Or, Sarah, is that it, or do you have something else you want to tell us about work going forward? Uh, I don't believe so. We have a list of, uh, we discussed with the staff the concerns raised by the, um, by the comments last year, and we're waiting to get feedback on those from the staff and uh, the policy committee. Okay. Thank you very much. Then let's turn to landlord tenant, which I believe is Steve's, right? That's me, yes. Thank you. This is memorandum 2024-8, uh, reporting on an ongoing commission study relating to terminology that is used in many California code sections to refer to parties to <laughs> residential real property rental agreements. The study uh, asked the commission to uh, evaluate a few different issues uh, relating to that terminology. And this memorandum addresses one of those, the first one, which putting together everything which is in the bill asks the commission to evaluate whether it would be prudent and practicable for the legislature to adopt a comprehensive statutory scheme standardizing the terminology used to refer to these parties over all the California codes, while at the same time preserving the legal distinctions intended by the legislature relating to these terms. Uh, the staff has evaluated that issue, and for the reasons set forth in the memorandum, has uh, tentatively concluded that the adoption of such a scheme by the legislature would not be uh, prudent and practical uh, at this time. And the reason is because in the somewhere near a thousand different code sections in which these parties are referred to in, in a significant number, there is no definition of the party as, as characterized in the code section. Uh, and so trying to conform these terms to standardize this terminology without knowing the intended precise legal meaning of the term in many of these code sections, the staff believes would be effectively impossible to do. Um, and so the staff's proposal is that because the legislature also also wants a draft report from the commission addressing a number of different issues, that the draft report would include uh, certainly a much more detailed explanation about why the commission feels that it would not be prudent and practical for the legislature to adopt this comprehensive scheme, given the current state of affairs in the, in the codes. Uh, and then with the staff would go on now and address the other issues that the uh, legislature has charged us with looking at. The next one would be um, whether the terms landlord and tenant are archaic or otherwise inappropriate to be used, notwithstanding definitional issues, but just whether there may be a better term for either one of those. Uh, there also are issues that the legislature has asked about relating to uh, law of other states and law used in uh, contracts and in case law. So that is the, that's the staff's proposal at this time. Happy to field any questions or comments. Commissioners, I have to just want to note that. Are there commission questions or comments received? Hearing none, uh, Chris, were you signaling 
that there's a member of the public would like to be heard? Yeah, so we have two hands raised over here. So I don't know if the commission wants to take public comment at this time. No commissioner appears um, in line to speak. So please go ahead, Kristen. Okay, I will uh, promote the first person that is Whitney Prout. Uh, Whitney, you should have speaking privileges now. Yes, thank you. Hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, so I'm Whitney Prout. I'm the Executive Vice President of Legal Affairs at the California Apartment Association. Um, I wanted to first thank Steve for reaching out to us to solicit feedback. Steve, I apologize. I haven't uh, been able to touch base with you directly before now, but uh, did get your email and I, I really appreciate you reaching out. Um, I reviewed the staff report and uh, preliminarily uh, agree with the recommendation that I think it would be really, uh, really difficult to try and move forward with what the, the legislative direction was to sort of do an overhaul without making substantive distinctions um, for the reasons that are outlined in the staff report. So I uh, just wanted to pop on here and express that uh, I agree with the staff report. I've been practicing this area of law, landlord tenant for a long time. Um, it's a rapidly evolving area at this point. And so I think trying to uh, make changes without having substantive effect would be really, really difficult. So um, thank you for the work. And that is all I have at this point. Thank you. And we do have one other commenter with hand raised and I will allow them to talk now. And that is uh, Ron Kingston. Ron, uh, you should have speaking privileges. Thank you so much. Um, as rep our firm represented the original sponsor of the legislation, uh, the Apartment Association in Orange County, and our fo primarily focus and the entire legislative discussion and deliberations on the uh, enabling legislation uh, focused on residential landlord tenant. We uh, concur with uh, narrowing the scope uh, recommended by uh, staff uh, and thanks Steve uh, for preparing the report. Uh, just by way, real quick background, uh, what our research showed, even within the scope of the the areas of the code dealing with residential landlord tenant, uh, we have found a tremendous conflict uh, or confusion at best, because uh, sometimes it's a lessee, sometimes it's a lessor, sometimes it's a tenant, uh, sometimes it is a uh, resident. For landlords, they're described uh, any number of ways, even within the same code section, they're described three different ways, three different times. So narrowing the scope is appropriate. It comports with um, the uh, uh, recommendation of uh, Steve and legislation. We look forward to uh, working with uh, the commission and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, um, it sounds like you have the direction you, you need. Is it, do you have Are any you other did. questions for us? Commissioner Simpson has a hand raised here. Sorry, I didn't see the commissioner's hand up. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I, maybe this is a, a question for Mr. Kingston, if he's still on. It, I, it, I wasn't clear on your description. Uh, um, it's like the term landlord can mean a variety of things, even in the same, you know, article. Are you suggesting we should, if we have multiple definitions, like one is just the person who owns the, the property. Another definition is the owner and the manager. Are you suggesting we should have two, two different words to define that? Or no, because you, by, by contract, uh, um, by contract and drafted several of them. Um, there are, um, when it, let's say it's a landlord, it can be a landlord or agent because the agent represents the landlord. So as long as the commission unifies and you know cleans up the code sections uh, in this narrow space of uh, residential landlord tenant law, we feel very confident that uh, the agent uh, will unquestionably be included um, because of contract law. So we're we're good. Um, and once the commission tackles the uh, the renaming, and um, it should be 
more than sufficient. Um, in commercial uh, real property, it is uniformly lessee, lessor. Um, in residential, that's, as I pointed out, nowhere near the case. So you, you will be good with what hopefully uh, becomes a universal term for the re the uh, name of a residential um, property owner slash, if you will, agent. Does that help you? Um, Doesn't tell I can sure. get your face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure um, because at least what I thought I understood Steve to be saying was that that element trying to uh, create a universal, if you will, definition for the word landlord was going to be really tough as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, in the law, the landlord means the person who owns the property, but if you want to include some other entity, you have to say landlord and manager or and agent or something like that. So maybe I'm a little confused about Steve's I, I guess I read, uh, Mr. Simpson, I, I think I read the memo slightly different and Steve will unquestionably uh, chime in here, but he presented the case of multiple code sections dealing with all sorts of subject matters here right. and the recommendation so we don't go crazy and occupy the commission's time for now until 2035 on this subject matter is to narrow the scope, um, which again, comports with um, the direction of the legislative deliberation on this matter to just residential uh, land, uh, landlord period and of course tenant. Um, and everybody should uh, move along in the same path uh, consequently. And so whatever we come up with the term landlord, new name, um, in this narrow area of law um, will resolve um, the, or should resolve the, the confusion that exists under current landlord-tenant law. So I don't want to get involved in, it was never our intent to get involved in, as uh, uh, Mr. Cohen points out in his uh, memo, uh, into other areas um, that refer to this even like he was re referring to um, some remote discussion of, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, other other areas uh, not having anything to do with the the direction of of uh, the legislation, the deliberation, and the problems. So hopefully we'll 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 get to it and. And um, I hope the commission embraces Mr. Cohen's uh, recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Um, maybe that's maybe that's a question for Steve because I my understanding maybe I'm I'm, I'm wrong was that the that what he was suggesting we do move forward on is looking at the particular terms landlord and tenant landlord you know antiquated suggests you know social stratification kind of kind of issue and maybe that's not the kind of term we ought to have in state law because of the you know potential implications of it and and is there another term we could use I, I thought that was the direction he was going as opposed to how is the term landlord defined and can you create a uniform definition for landlord you know w without mucking up what's in the law so maybe so I, I'm, I'm happy to try to clarify. The bill requests that the commission do several different things. One of the things that it requests the commission to do is evaluate whether it would be prudent and practicable for the legislature to adopt a comprehensive statutory scheme 
standardizing the terminology referring to parties in a residential real property rental agreement. It's only been about residential. With, there's no issue about commercial properties here at all. And if the commission were to conclude that adoption of such a scheme would be prudent and practicable, then the commission should actually recommend statutory revision to implement the scheme. What the staff is saying here is staff has researched and evaluated this first issue and is proposing to the commission that it would not be prudent and practical for the legislature to adopt this comprehensive statutory scheme. And we will report that to the legislature in a draft report that we submit at the end of the year. I'm also, the staff is also proposing that having sort of set aside that issue, we now proceed to a second request that the legislature gave to us, which is to evaluate without regard to uh, standardizing terminology at all, independent of that, whether the term landlord and tenant are inappropriate terms to be used in code sections because they are antiquated, archaic, they convey various social things, et cetera. That would be a separate topic for this draft report. And then there are other issues as laid out in the, in the memo that would also be included in the draft report and that the staff would start working on those other issues now, including the landlord tenant issue, as well as other issues. I actually was gonna ask whether um, we need to have a vote. I, I thought I did have the direction that the commission wants the staff to proceed, but perhaps it's unclear and maybe I should ask and we should have a vote on whether it's appropriate for the staff to proceed. Yeah, what it is that the staff proposes to do. So I need, I suppose, direction on that. Yeah, why don't, why don't we take the vote so it's clear to you, Steve? Okay, that would be, that's great. Thank you. And I, I also, I don't know if we're, Further engaging with Mr. Kingston, or we is that enough? What I've said, or I think he's endorsed. I think both public speakers have endorsed your recommendation. So we do have uh, Mr. Kingston has raised his hand again. The commissioners like to have Mr. Kingston has something new to say. That yes, if it's just repeating what he said, um, we we heard it the first time, Mr. Kingston. I will allow him to talk again. My hand before Mr. Cohen spoke. I'm I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. I move the okay. report. Uh, Commissioner Kubas has moved approval of the report. Executive Director, would you call the roll? Sure. But we need a second. Oh, I'll second it. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Still in the British system. <laughs> There's no second. Oh, really? There's not even that. Okay, so on the landlord tenant memo, I'm going to call the roll. Uh, Commissioner B. Aye. Commissioner Carrillo. Aye. Commissioner Carrion is not present. Commissioner Kubas. Aye. Commissioner e Aye. Commissioner Jenkins. She had to step away, so she is not present right now. Okay. Um, Assembly Member Calra is not present. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Simpson? Aye. And noting that Senator Rock is not present. Thank you. So the motion carries. Thank you, Steve. Um, Kristen, you've got the last agenda item, obsolete trial court restructuring. And not to rush you, since um, it's been a 45 year project, hasn't it? Uh, but we will, we will lose Commissioner Kubas in eight minutes. So if you're looking for a vote, uh, we'd like to get to the vote before we lose her. Certainly, and this should be very quick, Commissioners. So Memorandum 2024-9 presents a draft final recommendation, which we do need a commission vote to approve 
Um, the recommendation was circulated back in May 2023 for comments. We did not receive any comments. Um, it just rep proposes repeal of a single penal code section that appears to be obsolete related to uh, trial court fund distribution. So the, as it describes, we got feedback that indeed uh, the, the affected folks do appear to think that it's obsolete. And given that, we are just asking the commission on whether to approve the attached draft as a final recommendation for submission to the legislature and publication in the commission's official reports. Move to approve. Second. Are there, what, I appreciate the <laughs> expedition. Are there any comments <laughs> by members of the commission? Hearing none, are there any members of the public with their hands raised? No members of the public with their hands raised and I can call the roll if you would like. Please do. Thank you. Well, uh, we you did you record the motion in the second? We do not typically record the motion in the second in our minutes, but I've made a note. I know there were two seconds. I only caught one. Uh, <laughs> but we do you have what you need. Call the roll. Dean, uh, Commissioner B. Aye. Commissioner Carrillo. Aye. Commissioner Kuba. Aye. Commissioner Hebner. Enthusiastically, I. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner King. I. And Commissioner Simpson. Gratefully, I. <laughs> Very good. I appreciate that, Commissioners. And that is all we need for that memo. And I believe that is all for the agenda. So thank you all. <laughs> Does any commissioner have other business they'd like to raise? Hearing none. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. I'll call the roll. Commissioner B. Aye. Commissioner Carrillo. Aye. Commissioner Kubas. Aye. Commissioner Heber. Aye. Commissioner Jenkins is still on. Commissioner King. Aye. And Commissioner Simpson. Aye. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, commissioners, and thank you, staff, for a well-prepared, excellent meeting today. And thank you to the members of the public who participated. We are adjourned. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.